Hello again, everyone. This is Bill Owen, ready with another podcast in our series. Uh, we don't uh, we don't link these podcasts. There's no common theme. We cover a lot of ground: sports, science fiction, the great superstars of, of fiction: Batman, Superman, Captain Marvel, old time radio shows, movie serials, authors, famous authors. Big bands, yeah, wide ranging. But today, a really unique topic. We're titling this Famous Radio Stars Without Voices. Now, that seems like a contradiction. How can that be? Famous Radio Stars Without Voices. Well, we have five examples for you. Do you remember Carl Anderson's comic strip character, Henry, a little bald headed boy, ran for decades in the newspapers, comic books? He never talked. In fact, sometimes he was drawn without even a mouth. He, bald-headed boy, never talked as a mute. But but we did, we did see him in the funny papers. He didn't say anything. Well, here are some well-remembered radio stars who were neither seen nor heard. Well, you'll catch on in a minute. The first one to come to mind is Umbriago. Comedian Jimmy Durante used to refer to him. He always got a laugh at the mere mention of his name. It's an Italian-American term for a drunkard and uh, it became so well-known on radio, at least two World War II bombers were named Umbriago. He was Durante's pal. Yeah, and uh, we never heard his voice, though. Durante and Irving Caesar wrote a song for a 1944 comedy film called Music for Millions and became a big hit on Decca Records. One of the lines was, Umbriago could be mayor of New York or Chicago. Umbriago raised Cain from Portland, Maine to Santiago. Umbriago. Just picture Jimmy Durante. Remember his theme song? ink a dink a doo a dink a doo Yeah, Jimmy Durante. Jimmy Durante, or uh, Good Night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. But what did that mean? A lot of people heard him for years and often wondered. Well, first of all, Calabash was a small town in North Carolina, and his first wife, named Jean, she liked the name, and he just got an idea to say it at the end of each broadcast. But then it turned out that uh, his second wife, Margaret, said it just was picked out of thin air. It didn't have any significance, so you have your choice. Did it refer to the little town in North Carolina, or did it mean simply nothing? Jim used to call himself the Schnozola, referring to his big nose. He had a uh, lot of partners over the years. Clayton, he had uh, Gary Moore. Oh, one of his sayings was, I'm ready for Broadway. But is Broadway ready for me? <laughs> A beloved character. How about this one? I haven't slept for days and days. It's a good thing I sleep at night. <laughs> Jimmy Durante just makes me smile just to think about it. So there is Umbriago, a famous radio star without a voice. And then there was uh, Duffy of Duffy's Tavern. Duffy's Tavern, Ed Gardner, the star of that show, it began in 1941. You start out with the theme song of When Irish Eyes Are Smiling. And uh, you'd hear it, the theme would fade and the telephone would ring and you'd hear, uh, Hello, Duffy's Tavern, where the elite meet to eat. Archie, the manager speaking. Duffy, oh, hello, Duffy. Well, <laughs> that was the uh, Duffy that we never got to hear. You imagine the conversation. And uh, actually, it was a rundown restaurant, and uh, it it didn't amount to too much. But Duffy's Tavern was as famous a restaurant as there ever was back in the 1940s. His real life wife was uh, Shirley Booth, who later divorced, and uh, she played Duffy's daughter, who originally was Miss Duffy. Oh, I had that thick Brooklynese Brooklynese accent, Shirley Booth. Duffy of Duffy's Tavern. Mm-hmm. We're talking about famous radio stars without voices. Yeah. And some we have to think about uh, about Mama, Mary Livingston Mama on the Jack Penny Show. 
his real life wife, Mary Livingston, who would read these letters from Mama often. And the letters uh, would refer to Jack as that petty pinching, no good four flusher. Well, uh, she supposedly lived back home in Plainfield, New Jersey, though Mary herself was actually born in Seattle, raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. Her birth name was Sadia Markowitz, later known as Sadie Marks. Mary Livingston with letters from Mama. Uh, one of her lines, a sister babe once got her nose caught in a vacuum cleaner. Just, just silly things. We'll come back to Jack in just a moment, but uh, continuing our list, there was Skinny Dugan, Charlie McCarthy's mythical friend. And, uh, well, later, later years, there was a dummy on Detroit television show called Sagebrush Shorty. That was in the late 1950s. But uh, Charlie Skinny Dugan was much uh, earlier than that. Edgar Bergen uh, had remembered an Irish newspaper boy he saw one time, and that inspired him to have a dummy made, uh, modeled after this newspaper boy. And that, that uh, became Charlie McCarthy, wearing the monocle over his right eye, often wore a tuxedo top hat, very impish character. There was uh, Candace Bergen, of course, was the daughter, the actress Candace Bergen, the daughter of, of Edgar Bergen. There were some other dummies on the show. Mortimer Snurd always played the stupid country character. There was the man chasing Effie Clinker. And there was a dancing partner with a southern drawl. Her name was Podine Puffington. Uh, Charlie was number one and Mortimer number two. And a lot of people don't even remember Effie or or Podine. How about Mert, the telephone operator on Fibber, McGee, and Molly? We never heard her, but they always were talking to her. Fibber was, at least. Fibber was famous for his catchphrases like, Dad rat, the dad ratted, or, uh, or Molly saying, Heavenly days, McGee. She never called him Fibber. Always called him McGee. Taint funny, McGee, she would say. Or uh, Gildersleeve used to say, uh, You're a hard man, McGee. <laughs> How about the old timer? He used to say, after a joke, he'd say, uh, That's pretty good, Johnny, but that ain't the way I heard it. The way I heard it was, and so on and so forth. And the most famous beloved line from that show is, of course, Molly saying, Oh, McGee, don't open that hall closet. <laughs> Everything would come tumbling out. People looked forward to that. For many years, it was... Uh, a regular in the lineup on Tuesday night on NBC. Comedy night. Oh, nobody wanted to miss Fibber McGee and Molly. Well, when Mert was on the line, and Fibber would pick up the phone and, and uh, hello, operator, get me. Oh, is that you, Mert? Your uncle smashed his face and broke his hands? And Molly would say, uh, heavenly days, did her uncle have a bad fall? And Fibber says, no, no, he dropped his watch. Oh, uh, well, actually, Mert did appear in one episode on June 22nd, 1943, but it's safe to say, for the most part, we never heard from Mert. So there you go. There are the five famous ones. Umbriago, there was Duffy of Duffy's Tavern. There was Mama, with letters from Mama. There was Skinny Dugan and Mert, the telephone operator. Jack Benny, what a, what a wonderful program he had. So many delightful people. Dennis Day, singer, Kenny Baker preceded him. And, uh, well, he had, he had several tenors before he settled on Baker, and then later Dennis Day. He had, he had uh, Michael Bartlett, Frank Parker, James Melton, Larry Stevens, who was the last of the Jack Benny cast to pass away. He, he filled in during the war years. There was the Sportsman Quartet, and uh, not just not just Phil Harris's orchestra. No, he had Ted Weems. He had George Olson originally, Don Bester, Frank Black, Johnny Green, Bob Crosby for a while. Some of the characters. Oh, and uh, Mel Blanc did the sound of Jack's Maxwell automobile, as well as the train announcer, which we'll talk about in a moment. There was John L. C. Savoni, Frank Frank Fontaine. Rochester. Oh, how many, how many wonderful characters. 
There was Martha and Emily, a couple of old ladies who always had a crush on Jack, played by Jane Morgan and Gloria Gordon. Oh, the catchphrases from that era. Jack Benny, when he was frustrated, he'd say, Now cut that out! Yeah. He was noted for his sense of timing. Speaking of timing, uh, another time when we'd get frustrated, the, the sportsman quartet would just go on and on and irritate him. And he'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I'd get carried away. Phil Harris used to, used to call him Jackson. How are you, Jackson? Very fresh, Phil Harris. Famous for... Uh, Oh, the the thing was a big hit song for Phil Harris. And he's also famous for his for his own theme song. Won't you come with me to Alabama? Back to see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and cooking hammy, and that's what I like about the South. How about Rochester as valet? He was scheduled for one appearance, and he was so popular he became a permanent fixture on the show. And uh, there was one sequence where he would express gradual understanding of something. At first, he didn't catch on. He'd say. Oh, 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 <laughs> he'd always get a laugh with that. Dennis Day might say something like, yes, please. That would get a laugh. How about the train conductor we mentioned, Mel Blanc? Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. He put those places on the map, that's for sure. Andy Devine was one of his early regulars, and he dropped out later to pursue his film career. Well, he used to say, uh, Hiya, Buck, in that gravelly voice. How did he get that gravelly voice? As a young boy, he had a popsicle stick in his mouth, and he fell, and it damaged his vocal cords. It turned out to be a blessing. His, his voice was his, was his career. Hiya, Buck. Yeah. Frank Nelson, one simple word he stretched out. He would say, Yes. That's Frank Nelson. Sheldon Leonard, famous for, uh, psst, hey, buddy, and that famous joke about uh, he's a hold-up man. Your money, your life, and there's long pause, and then Benny says, uh, I'm thinking it over. Got a long, long laugh. Oh, Jack Benny it was an institution, wasn't he? Oh, Mr. Kitzel, I remember him. Pickle in the middle and the mustard on top. Just the way you like them, and they're always hot. And Jack would say, why, Mr. Kitzel? And hear the great applause. Jack started out on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1931. The following year, he was on his own program for Canada Dry over CBS and then sponsored by Chevrolet. But after that, his long associations with Jello and Lucky Strike. J-E-L-L-O, remember that? Sunday nights. Oh, many running gags on his show. The Feud with Fred Allen. Benny's perpetual age of 39. People still say that today. I'm 39, like Jack Benny. His stinginess, which was fictional. He was very generous in real life. His ancient Maxwell automobile, which was startup. <laughs> all with Mel Blanc's wonderful voice and talent. How about the vault in the basement? He used to keep his money, and the guard down there said he hadn't seen the light of day since the Civil War. And there was a polar bear named Carmichael that lived in Benny's basement, and according to Rochester, he ate the gas man. Jack's blue eyes, they talked about, his attempts to play the violin. Uh, all he had to do was just appear, and people would laugh. He, he had such great followers. And uh, uh, I just have such great memories of, of listening to Jack Benny. It was, it was just normal. Six o'clock Central Time in, uh, in, oh, for decades. We'd turn on the radio, and usually it was dinner time, and listen to the Jack Benny program. Don Wilson, the announcer. Well, it's always fun for me reminiscing. I hope it is for you, too as we look back on uh, those wonderful memories of days gone by. This is Bill Owen, signing off for now.